evening, everyone, and thank you for coming tonight. Welcome to the Diversity Series Q&A here at the New York Film Academy. Tonight, we have an amazing guest that we're going to be talking with. 20 years of filmmaking have, have made him ha one of the most sought-after directors here in Hollywood. TV shows such as Heroes, Supernatural, Falling Skies, The West Wind, Grey's Anatomy, and The Mentalist are just one of the few names that he, that he has worked on. Most recently, he directed and executive produced the pilot for the space opera High Moon, which was created by the Pushing Daisies and Hannibal showrunner Brian Fuller. In features, his political thriller Formosa Betrayed won Best Feature and Best Actor at the San Diego Film Festival and also won the Audience Award in the Philadelphia Asian American Festival. Adam's family drama The Fix won nine major festival awards and also qua um, qualified for the 2007 Academy Awards. Throughout his, his career, he has worked with numerous actors. Between them, we can count Matthew McConaughey, Samuel L. Jackson, Robert Downey Jr., Charlie Sheen, Willem Dafoe, among many others. So I'm sure that you guys have a lot of questions and we are going to have a great time interviewing. So without further ado, guys, Mr. Adam Kane. Welcome, and thank you for talking with us today. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. You accomplished a lot, even within film school. You won two years in a row, right? Um, NYU, uh, NYU Film Festival. Yeah. It's best cinematography. Yeah. You, shot, uh, you started working a lot just as a cinematographer. I shot 14 or 15 movies while I was at NYU in my last two years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I was able to experiment and fail a lot. And that's, that was one of the biggest, is, that's one of the biggest things that will follow you throughout your career is you have to be willing to fail. You have to be willing to try things that are not going to work. You have to be willing to try things that scare the shit out of you. You have to be willing to do things that may be going against the grain because you feel in your gut that it's the best way to tell a story or to make an image. And if you don't do that, then you will always stay in a, in a bubble of mediocrity. And what about your life right after school? I shot music videos for free. I shot uh, industrials. I shot commercials. I shot news for Associated Press for about three years during um, the uh, the bombing of the Oklahoma um, Federal Building with Timothy McVeigh. I shot the OJ trial. I shot I shot all kinds of stuff, and that was one of the greatest experiences. I was just talking to Carl about this. It's one of the mo it's one of the best experiences for me as a filmmaker because when you shoot news, mm -hmm. the story is unfolding as you're shooting it. You don't have a script, and you have to you have to shoot pieces and tell the story as it's happening. You don't, you don't get a redo. And so you're constantly reacting to your gut instinct. But that, but that training I use every day, yeah. and I've used every day as a cinematographer, I use it as a, as a director, I use it as a filmmaker. It teaches you to sharpen your skills and think quickly. And so what I usually tell people is just shoot whatever. Shoot whatever. I, sh I think I shot 20 short films. Because every time you do a short film, you get, to, you get to experiment with something. You get to try something new that maybe you wouldn't try on a job where you're getting paid, where they're expecting something different. So shoot whatever. So now that, that we're talking about your beginnings and how you created your career as a cinematographer, can you tell us about your influences? Th what I discovered when I started shooting is that there were two types of cinematographers. There were, there were storytellers and there were people who loved cameras. What I loved was the storytelling process. I loved being able to put the right actor with the right wardrobe and the right lighting at the right angle telling the right story and that to me was magic and it still is. Like that's why I do all this is because I'm looking to recapture those moments. Um, and so people like Gordon Willis, who passed away last year, or this year, didn't he? Um, Douglas Slocum, who's a British DP that shot Indiana Jones, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, which to me is like a beautifully photographed movie. These were some of the, the, the guys who I was um, influenced by in, in the camera world, in the cinematography world. And all of them, no matter how sophisticated or simple, the photography was, it was always expressive of the perfect blend of all the things that I just talked about. Mm -hmm. It was about the storytelling. It was not about the flash. And people like, people like, you know, um, Owen Roisman, who shot The French Connection, another one of my favorite movies, let the lighting be ugly. What we would consider to be ugly with like top light and deep shadows under people's eyes, which is, you know, what Gordon Willis did in The Godfather, all those great shots of Marlon Brando in the study when you've got these deep shadows, which is considered to be very unattractive in Hollywood, mm -hmm. at that time especially. And that to me was beautiful because it was so evocative of the story. And so making that connection 
where, and I heard, and I, and I heard something, David Slade, who um, directed Hard Candy, he talks about that a lot, which I, which I also agree with, which is cinematography and the visual language of storytelling is as much of a part of the emotional performance as the actors actually performing the drama and the words. All right. So, let's talk about uh, how you transitioned from being a cinematographer into directing and how these two specific uh, shows that you worked on, 24 and Fushi Daisies, um, how, were, how different these experiences were and, and how much creative input do you have in both shows and how did that work? What happened as a result of doing it for the number of years that I was involved as a cinematographer is I worked with a lot of different types of directors and some of the directors that I worked with um, didn't have the gift of visualization which I had never considered before. I mean, I saw things in pictures in my head, mm -hmm. and that's how I translated. So when I went to light something as a cinematographer, I knew where I was going with it. But what I didn't consider, and this, and this goes for a lot of executives in Hollywood as well, is that the reason why they don't know what they want is that they can't see it, which was something that I only learned, I discovered as I was working. Yeah. What eventually happened is that I started reading scripts as a director, which I didn't realize. And I started having a visual sensation of how I wanted to tell the story. Because oftentimes I was hired on lower budget projects to help first time directors. When I started looking at material as, as a, through a director's eye and I was the cameraman, I started in some circumstances to become very um, frustrated. And that's when I realized that I had, to, I had to shut up. Because it's not the cinematographer's job to direct. It's the cinematographer's job to support the vision of the director. And if the, if the director can't find their voice, it's the cinematographer's job to help, fi help the director find their voice. And I found that I had, in my mind, a better story to tell than the director, the, half the directors were that I was working with. Did directing g uh, <coughs> gave you like a new appreciation on, on making films or telling stories or as a storyteller? Well, it, it, for me, it was a very natural progression. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know that I would feel that way. Because for me, orchestrating a large picture that was design-based came very naturally to me. So being able to talk wardrobe and set design and cinematography with people that were in charge of those disciplines was a natural extension of being a cinematographer. Because the truth is, is that you're having all those conversations anyways. So if, you, if someone wears a light color, like your jacket, and it's too bright for camera, and you're the, the cinematographer saying, well, we need to like tone that down. It's got to be a shade or two darker because on camera it's going to pop too much. You're being the arbiter of what was going to happen in the photography. So as a director, I'm able to use all those tools and be able to say, well, no, I want the jacket to pop. Because as a story point, I, when that character is under bright light, I want the audience to feel that there's something burning inside of them, literally. Mm -hmm. And that that's going to photograph as, as being overexposed. And maybe that's a statement that I want to make. So I'm able to have all those conversations with all the department heads in a, in a really specific fashion. So now, uh, now that we're going into that, what about Pushing Daisies? I mean, it's drastically different. From drastically different, yeah. I mean, look, you know, Pushing Daisies is like one of the, the biggest heartbreaks of my career because the show was canceled after a season and a half, and it was one of the most creative experiences that I've ever had. Making that kind of a show as a filmmaker is like being in the, being in the sandbox all day long because there were a couple stylistic things about the way to tell the show, which you probably noticed. There was symmetry inside the frames, and characters were always center punched, and we were always using very, very wide angle lens, unconventionally, to, to shoot the characters, like 21 millimeters close. And therefore, the actors were acting oftentimes when they were in singles, like if we were in a headshot, I mean, the camera literally was about this far away. So you couldn't actually have the other actors in their correct spaces. So they were often acting to pieces of tape, colored tape around the mat box. Because if they actually looked to the actor, they'd be looking like halfway across the room because of the dynamic of the lens. It was a certain style that you had to shoot that show. And as a filmmaker, as a director, it was a little bit of an open canvas on how to actually tell the story. And oftentimes, we, when we were doing performance takes, we would do a dramatic take, we'd do a comedic take, we'd do a take that was somewhere in between, and we'd do a take that was dry. And we found an editorial that sometimes when you're cutting back and forth, because there's so many cuts in the show, that you'd be using elements of all four performances in one edit. And so we were, we were shooting a tremendous amount of material for that show. But because of the, the, the nature of the show, of it being very wide lenses, very close, there was oftentimes not room for a second camera. 
So that show is mostly a single camera show, even though we had two cameras available. Whereas 24 is a two, three, four, or five camera show because of how that show is shot like a news program. 24, by contrast, has a very established style for anybody who saw the show. This is season nine, right? Live Another Day. And you can go back to seasons one, two, three, four, five, and it, they all look like this. And so when I was hired as a director, I was hired to come in and fabricate and duplicate the style of the show and work with a movie actor doing a TV show who is Kiefer. And Kiefer has director approval and like it's, it's, a, it's a system there because he's a particular kind of animal. But when you're hired to do that show, you're hi being hired to manage Kiefer and you're being hired to replicate the brand of 24. And all things being equal to me, five guys could have directed that show because the handheld zooming in, punctuating, like that's the show. That's not, that, I didn't bring that to the show. I brought my vision of how to shoot the scenes, but I didn't shoot the style. The style's not new. But in Pushing Daisies, part of crafting that show right from the beginning was about, br was about establishing the language, and I was a part of that. So I was able to bring a lot of my filmmaking perspectives, and some of the, some of the quick push-ins, and the tilt-downs, and the whip pans, like that was all me. Since you came into Heroes when it wasn't, uh, they still were putting together how it was going to be, and it was, you know, yeah. the pilot, how much uh, creative input do you had in it, since it was the very first episode? Um, I, I had a lot of, they gave me a lot of rope to hang myself with, mm -hmm. um, because my, <laughs> which is a good and a bad thing. I, uh, I had a vision for the show that was, w that was based in a, in a graphic sensibility, but not in a comic book sensibility. Okay. I didn't, the show was about heroes. It was about people with extraordinary abilities who were ordinary people. Mm -hmm. But I didn't want to make it with Dutch dangles and like a Batman movie. I wanted it to be graphic in the sense that the shapes inside the frame were um, cinematic in the way that they told the story, mm -hmm. but weren't demonstrative of trying to be style over substance for the sake of trying to overshadow the drama. I found the characters in the script to be very relatable, and I wanted that to come across, but I wanted to do it in a, in a larger than life way. So a lot of what we constructed when we were shooting was wide angle lenses very close to characters because one of the properties of wide angle lenses is that you feel like you're inside the character's space. So if you shoot a close up and you're on a 40 or a 35 mil as opposed to a 100 mil, you're gonna feel much more like you're inside the experience of the people. And that was our, that was our, uh, one of our, um, our cinematic languages that we applied for all of Heroes, not just the pilot, but went all the way through and that was one of the things that I brought to it. Mm -hmm. Um, was always to try and create a graphic frame to tell the story. Mm -hmm. And you can't always do that in a TV show, like there's some normal coverage in, in, t in television. And that's a function of, of the artistry of what goes into a show versus time and money. Yeah. But the truth is, is that if you don't have things that are normal, mm -hmm. if everything is outrageous, then nothing's special anymore. And I think that you actually have to have some things that are quote unquote neutral in order, to, in order for the storytelling that's cinematic to really stand out. Well, you said first. So now that you're talking about um, television and how it is all really fast and you have to, mm. to do all those things. How is it op as opposed to film, working uh, doing features? Uh, feature films are director driven and television is writer driven. That's the most basic division that I can tell you about. In feature films, there's a great amount of attention put to schedule and will the director have enough time to be able to put his vision on the screen to be able to tell the story? In television, Schedules and budgets are put together before the stories are written, and then the stories have to fit together with the budgets. So it's an inverted process, and it's, not, it's artificial, it's not natural. If you're a director and you have 10 pages to shoot in a day, and that's what your mandate is, and you gotta shoot, well then you're gonna have to burn through a lot of stuff to, to make the day. And maybe it's, maybe it's not gonna be as good as if you shot seven pages and you did a better job on well, each scene. Sometimes less is more, right? Well, less is more, and like Pushing Daisies was exactly that concept, because a lot of time we were shooting two shots without any coverage. We weren't shooting close-ups on everybody in every scene, but that was the style that we embraced for the show. So that, that actually worked, and that, that was sort of built in budget-wise. You are sought after in television because of your gifts, your talents, your artistry, your demo reel, all that stuff. You are paid for your speed. You are paid because you are a quick thinker. You're paid because you make decisions quickly. You're paid because you work within the parameters of the schedule. The two things don't equal each other mm -hmm. and they're not part of the same sentence. You are not paid because of your artistry. 
I guarantee it. You're sought out because of your artistry. So now that you're talking about being a cinematographer and a director, how do you juggle both both things? Are you working on a project as a director <coughs> and the cinematographer all of a sudden takes over? It's uh, You try to treat both things as a separate set of skills, so it just come together, and, and how does that work for you? Is that you are compartmentalized in the industry. If you're a cinematographer, you shoot, you don't direct. If you're a cinematographer, you can make pretty pictures, but you can't actually direct actors. And none of it's really true. But, that, but that's being, those judgments are being made by people who've never done your job. Because the production executive at Warner Brothers has never actually pulled cable or set a light or you know, had to shoot or had to direct. So that's one part of it. Yeah. Well, if you break the glass ceiling, as I was lucky enough to, and then you start directing, then people start asking, well, do you shoot anymore? Mm -hmm. And for me, I actually didn't have any time because I had been booked so much as a director that I, I actually had no time to shoot. So for me, and I believe that one cannot do the two jobs concurrently effectively. You can't do both jobs simultaneously and give full attention to both. It's not possible. This being said, like I have several low budget projects that I'm going to direct and produce that I will also shoot as a function of budget. But I do it in small chunks or in projects where it's manageable or we don't have the money. Um, but I'm like, you know, on, I, like on a movie, like I would never shoot my own movie. So what's your favorite thing about directing? Um, my favorite thing about directing is seeing the magic come together. And I know it sounds a little corny, but for me it's still true. It's like when you get all the elements of the, the actor, the right actor, the right wardrobe, the right lighting, the right camera angle, the right location, the right production design, the right visual effects, the right score. And it all coalesces together and it makes you feel something. And you know when you're shooting it if it makes you feel something. Like that's magic. Mm -hmm. And that's what I strive to do as a director. And by the way, it doesn't have to be something fancy. Most of the time it's not. Some, some of the time it's a stripped down, bare, you know, bare version of something, of a performance that an actor is experiencing. And sometimes that's the most in invigorating pieces of film that I've shot. Um, it's not the most exciting steady cam, crane shot, whatever. Like those things are interesting because it's a little bit of a visual technical exercise in like how you execute it. But it's not the most gratifying stuff that I've done. And what about your favorite thing about being a cinematographer? Um, you sort of get to, I mean, it's a little bit of voodoo in that nobody really knows how you light. <laughs> Especially when, when film existed, like, and really, like, you see the modern, like, say, oh, it's, it's not gonna look like that. It's like, that's all different now, because, like, you know, what you see is what you get. But n you, even with digital, you still have to know how to light. You still have to know what the light means from a storytelling perspective, how it makes an actor or an actress look more flattering or less flattering. And being able to sort of, you know, weave that for me with light and with diffusion and cutters and being able to shape that was a bit like painting, as they say, painting with light. Mm -hmm. And that to me was the most gratifying part of shooting, is being able to discover what that was and be able to take really dramatic chances as a cinematographer.